Tonight's subject is Turney Road. Um, it's quite a long road and it took 50 to 60 years to, uh, for the development to be completed along it. And uh, we'll be running, as it were, up and down the road um, to suit the different, uh, different dates. But the key will be the bridge. This is the bridge at the bottom end. So we start with the bridge. And the first slide we have is George Leonard Turney, after whom the road is named. He was a pin and needle manufacturer in Tooley Street. Um, he was um, a stalwart of St. Giles of the Vestry. He was an estate governor from 1871. Uh, so an all round um, good chap, if you like, um, very community minded. His personal life, was perhaps not quite so happy. His first wife died uh, quite young and his two first two children did, but he married again and had more children after that. Anyway, we'll come, we will come back to him later, but just to give you an idea, that's who, after whom the road was named. So let's move on to the 1860 estate map, which will, here is Dulwich Village, um, here is the site of the Dulwich Village Infants and Dulwich Hamlet School. And as you can see, there is no road. Uh, there's no road shown. The only thing that we can now see here is Croxted Lane at the bottom here. And you can see that they've already started, even though the railway came a couple of years after this, 1863-4, you can already see that they've drawn it on it. And you've got other potential railway lines and roads sort of sketched on, but I think that's the post-rationalization, if you like, they put those on afterwards. But anyway, the key is you can see whether that's a footpath, it's difficult to define, but the road, but, but, sorry, Turney Road runs more or less down like that. Um, although this has taken around 1900 and you can just see Turney Road, if you could imagine back before 1860, there would have been, there would just been a fence or a hedge there, but this building would have been there since it was built in 1820 uh, on the corner there, of Dulwich Village and Turney Road. And obviously you've got uh, 1662 further down, which are slightly earlier date. Just to remind us of um, Dulwich's rural, uh, of the sheep being um, pushed down College Road or Dulwich, Dulwich, sorry, Dulwich Village or High Street Dulwich as it was then, um, going to the Manor Waste, doing to and from the Manor Wastes. And there's a picture of 50 and 52 today, looking very spruce. Uh, Dulwich Village, there's the seat on the corner, Dulwich Society seat on the corner. And if you can imagine roughly where, where, that, where that house is, between that, the next house north, if you like, was this one, Beach House, later, very late in its life, called Warrigal, um, but stood roughly where, just beyond where the school is. And in fact, the school was built, and Turney Road, for that matter, were built in the grounds of this house, uh, which was still here in the very early 1920s, but not long after that. Here is the Dulwich Village Infant School built in the 1860s, a few happy children. And behind it would have been the Dulwich Hamlet School, which comes later. You can see there's the Village Infant School and here's the Hamlet later at the top end of Turney Road. But I'm not gonna detail in, the school's really a story in themselves and there's more for us to see further down. Now here we have just a brief, I don't expect you to read it all, um, nor I, Tedri, but it's to give you an idea. So in, the, in July 1866, um, they make the decision or the, the governors make the decision to build the new road linking Dulwich Village and Croxted Road. They refer to an agreement with the railway company who have agreed to build their part of the new road from Croxted Road up to the proposed station at Knights Hill. Well, we now know, of course, there was never any station built at Knights Hill, although there was a coal yard, and we'll come to that later, uh, but that was the original intention. So the idea was to link the station at Knights Hill 
with Dulwich Village. So 1866, they talk about it, but there's no mention then of a name. And then they start to construct the new road and it really, turning, the construction of Turney Road is a, is a story of drainage, really. Um, the, the, when they went out to tender for the road and the sewers under it, the winner was Mr. Downs. So Mr. Downs, 40, they had 14 tenders and Mr. Downs the winner. And of course, the reason Mr. Downs won it is because he was building Dulwich College at the same time or just about to start in Dulwich College. And he could obviously offset his overheads and profit in the college and do the road very cheaply. And the argument came, they originally wanted to do a brick sewer, but the vestry insisted on clay pipes. And this, as you can see, increased the cost um, and, you know, by 210 pounds. So they paid just over a thousand pounds for the whole road. What I haven't been able to confirm is how far they actually put the sewer in because it will come up again later when they have to replace it. Then having put the road and the sewer, in this case, the road would be just a dirt road. Uh, they then put signs up, which is what this notice board, this minute says about a notice board saying land for sale. The only offer they had was from Mr. Wilson, who was a very successful large scale builder in, in London, his office 33 Victoria Street, and who actually lived locally. We'll come on to him in a minute. And he made an offer for the land, but for some reason, they just weren't interested. The governors, despite the recommendation of the surveyor, uh, Charles Barry Jr., who said, this is a really, you know, this, is, this guy is a really good builder. This is what you need to get it going. They weren't interested. Now, whether they wanted bigger houses than Wilson offered, or whether they wanted um, to separate, if you like, to keep West Dulwich and Croxted Road away from Dulwich Village, there's nothing in the minutes to say, but basically from the road being built in the 18, mid 1860s, there was no development in the main part of Turney Road till after 1900. And just to give you a character, Mr. Wilson actually lived here in Fairfield, and this was on Dulwich Village. The current, its replacement also called Fairfield, as many of you will know, is currently a rather sad, a skeleton of a house held up by a large amount of steel scaffolding. Most of the, well, I think all the interior has been stripped out, uh, ready for uh, a new refurbishment or reconstruction. Anyway, that was Mr. Wilson's house, but they rejected him. So we now look at the 1876 map, very handy having these uh, maps online. And you can see, although it's written as, and here it is, Turney Road, so we come down from the village. There's the school, the Dulwich uh, Village Infant School. There's 50 and 52, which we saw before. So here is the, the road coming through. Here's Croxted Road, Croxted Lane. And here is the road that was built by the railway company. So this part of the road built by the railway company. And here um, is an extract. You won't be able to read it, but um, Callista Lucy at the Dulwich College Archive very kindly tried to look up how uh, the road actually was called Turney Road. And we haven't really been able to find anything other than to say that uh, Turney, Mr. Turney was on the committee for road naming in, in Dulwich um, in the early 1870s. So whether there, there was a Mr. Young, Mr. Turney and Mr. Hovenden. Uh, Hovenden lived in Thurlow Park Road. Um, so whether when they got to the state of naming names, the uh, committee sat around and said, well, um, how about naming it after, after you, Mr. Turney, as you're a, a well-known character, well-regarded in the neighborhood. And that's, we can only assume is what they did. But there were other things. Uh, so just after that uh, map was cast, the, we have the Dulwich College Cottage Company building some houses. Um, in the extended Boxall Road. Um, and here, this was ideally for, um, if you like, the work or the, the working classes, housing for the working classes. And these were built, as the sign says, if you look very carefully, in 1876. So development has started at this end, at the village end, but that's really as far as it gets. 
until we get to 1886. And here you have, again, here's the road. Um, here's Dulwich Village Infant School. Here is the upcoming Dulwich Hamlet. And it shows Burbage Road constructed. Now, what we do know, um, here's Burbage Road. It wasn't quite, uh, what happened? The problem they had was that these grounds were actually owned by the, the man in the Greyhound Tavern and were used as sports fields. And they built the first part of Burbage Road they built to here and they couldn't build it any further and they did a deal with him. So the first part of Burbage Road is built 1883 and the second part in 1886, but it's slightly more complicated than that. The governors, if you like, the estate were strong armed into building this part of Burbage Road because uh, of the, develop the drainage problems in Cropstead Road. Now, they'd already let land here in the mid 1870s to James Kerr Green, and he built his series of houses. They're still on both sides of the road. Only one side of the road is there. Um, but he could only drain them this way into the sewer in Thurlow Park Road. And if you look at the Ordnance Survey, the modern Ordnance Survey, you will see that the drain levels, marked drain levels, that they're gradually rising till about here. And at this point, they go the other way. And basically the vestry said, to Mr. Green, if you want to build any more houses, the sewer has got to be built here and it's got to go down Turney Road. Um, so the estate, if they wanted Green to finish his houses, the estate were forced to put in the new sewer down here. And they were quite happy to try and connect the two together until the vestry said, well, actually, that's not quite what we have in mind. You will, in fact, take it into the deep sewer in Half Moon Lane. Therefore, you will have to build Burbage Road with the sewer. So the sewers from here come along here, down Turney Road and down here. And the other sewer here connects that way. Complicated, but there you go. So these are a few of the notes about the sewers this time cost £7,770. And there's a whole load of blurb in the minutes about how they did it. Uh, you would have thought they would have learned from the predecessor. Anyway, it's all done. Burbage Road is in position. So let's go down Turney Road to the southwest end. Here is the railway line. We come over. Here is the road put in by the railway company. Here is the Knights Hill Coal Yard. This is where the station was supposed to be. And you can see that around 1890, development has started here on this part of Turney Road. These two large houses here and some smaller houses here. And here's Green. Here's Mr. Green. So the sewer is coming down here and going down there. Just to remind ourselves, this coal yard, the Knights Hill Coal Yard, um, and here's a train crossing over the road. There were two bridges over the road. If you go there now, there's only one. Um, and this, of course, is the site later uh, for Rosendale School, not ideally located, you would think, next to the coal yard. Anyway, it was. So here are the two houses. Well, one house in fairness, the one big house shown on the map. The other house was here, long gone. And these are slightly later houses. This is Kent Lodge, number 22. It's a, a fine, imposing build, well, certainly fine front. The back doesn't look quite so, uh, so generous, but it's quite good. But the, so number 20 here, which we don't see, we haven't got a picture of, was lived in by this chap here, Richard Godsell Kimber who was one of the families of the Hughes and Kimber organization who were manufacturers of printing presses. And you can see here, he lived at the house for quite a long time. He was a printer's engineer's manager, printer's engineer. So, and there's a picture of him, not a very good picture, but there he is. And there's one of his printing machines. Next door in Kent Lodge was the Mills family. Now Mills, um, the father calls himself a gas installer. Now that, to be able to build a house and be a gas installer suggests that he was probably slightly more than that, but we've not been able to track him down. But what we do have is that his daughter, Miss Sophie Mills, was a well-known singing teacher for very small children in the area. And this is her, if you like, short obituary in the Westminster Gazette of 1924. Uh, she was living in the house in 1911 with her 80-year-old mother. But the fascinating thing, she was holidaying 
at Smedley's hydropathic establishment in Matlock in Derbyshire. But even there, she was noted as a teacher of singing. She was obviously quite a well-known singing teacher. So we'll jump across the road. And here is um, the Rosendale School, built by the London School Board in the late 1890s. They bought the site for £2,800. And as no surprise in Dulwich, of course, the local NIMBYs objected, saying they really didn't need a school here. It would depreciate the value of their property and that there were no poor children anywhere near here. So there was no need for it. The temporary iron school buildings went up in 1897 and the school itself opened 1899, 1900 and late 1908. We know it was built by Treasurer and Son of Holloway and it cost 15,599 pounds. And it's currently listed grade two. It's recently been re-roofed. It's a fine building. It is a fine building. And there's some happy pupils. So moving, uh, no, before we move down the road, this is a slightly pressing picture. I couldn't help putting it in. This is what the old caretaker's house looks like today. Um, and this is what it looked like 10 years ago. I have that slight feeling that perhaps um, it's not quite as appreciated as it used to be and um, might be um, up for demolition. I don't like this sort of spare tires around it. Right, so looking down, this is Turney School here here, which is much later, much later. That's built on an industrial site behind uh, after World War II. But here is number 11 to 25 Turney Road. So that's on the left-hand side as you go down towards the railway bridge. Uh, there was a builder who lived there, a chap called Blewett. But here's a few other characters who lived in the road. At number 13, which is that house there, we have... Um, Alfred Inwood, who was the London editor of the Sheffield Daily Telegraph. Here's a picture of him on his retirement. Here he is receiving his uh, parting gift. At number 19, um, interesting, Tony Road, the original numbering um, started one, two, three, four at both ends, which must have been very confusing. But uh, 19, came 19 Tony Road pretty quickly. And the young owner here was Walter Wakefield Brain, who was. Um, called himself a railway auditor, working for the London South East and Chatham Railway Company. And in fact, he was also the honorary secretary to the Sydney Golf Club. And um, here's an advertisement for him for the club advertising for golf professional. The house at the end, 25 Turney Road, uh, built in the year again, 1891-92 by Halliday and Greenwood, occupied German, Thomas James McNamara. Here's uh, an advertisement we saw. He didn't stay there long. He was there in 1894. Um, and here he is. He's an MP, quite a well-known MP, um, born in Canada. He was a school teacher, moved to London become the, to edit the journal, the schoolmaster, the journal of the National Union of Teachers. Uh, he was a member of the Liberal Party and became a uh, member of parliament for North Camberwell in 1900. Um, he was on the wrong side when the Liberal Party split with David Lloyd George, and he lost his seat in 1923. So let's move further. We'll cross over the road now to coming down the road to Croxted. There's the house we looked at earlier next to Kent Lodge. We have these, we have this, and then we come down to West Dulwich Mansions, uh, the Maisonettes and Flats, which were built here. Here's uh, serious fires in, was quite a common problem um, in, in houses and flats at the time. Um, the, you know, the flat was practically destroyed. Three other flats sustained serious damage and his poor wife was badly burnt. Quite a common problem of clothes. People sat too close to the fire, non-fireproofing materials. Uh, quite a common problem. But here we have an advertisement for West Dulwich Mansions, an original advertisement. Uh, High-class neighbours, the appearance of superior double-fronted residences. If you've ever looked closely at West Dulwich Mansions, it does look like that. It is designed to look like bigger houses because there's only one in uh, the entrances to the flats are between the maisonette. So although you have one entrance, you do have, in fact, four doors. So this is the address. I'm sorry, it's, the picture's not better, but it is. Um, it talks about near to the station. Um, to public parks and Dulwich College, and you could rent one flat for 38 to 44 pounds a year. And he's also trying to sell 
the blocks as well. So not only does he see punting for occupiers in the flats for people to take the whole thing off his hands. And here he is. We have a picture of the builder, Stephen Admans, who was um, building at the same time Herne Hill Mansions. And you can see here he's advertising for Herne Hill Mansions. And here he is advertising later again for West Dulwich Mansions. But yes, happy chap with his nice hat. And here's um, an early photograph of the other Dalkeith elevation of um, West Dulwich Mansions with the sails, boards up, woman in the, in the window there, about 1904. And here it is today, in pretty good condition. I mean, I have to say West Dulwich Mansions does look in pretty good condition today. And just to give you some idea of this is something that uh, we came across uh, working with um, Duncan Bowie about the Dulwich Communist Party. I must say I'd never come across them before. Though this is 1947, um, the chap called Tony Farsky, who was a leading communist in the area, uh, lived in, in Dulwich, um, West Dulwich Mansions uh, at number 70. And this is, he published the Dulwich Communist Magazine. Uh, and uh, it's quite fascinating to see that the, the Dulwich Park open air entertainment, this was in the late 1940s, con bands, concert parties, ballet, children's entertainment, not to mention the British Soviet Society and the meeting of the Dulwich Communist Park Society. But quite a well, let's cross the road. Here's Croxted Road, the junction with Turney Road. Turney Road is here. This house was built uh, more recently, as many of you remember, 144A. Uh, by the estate. Uh, and this is the last houses built by James Kerr Green uh, in the late 1890s. And on the other side, there's the bridge again, on the other side of the road is these houses again built about in the late 1890s, 1900 by a builder called H.N. Grenside. So even by this, even let's say at 1900, you've got buildings, housing either side here, but you've got nothing in Turney Road. So we'll go again to the bridge and then we'll shoot straight down. And here we are crossing Burbage Road, the crossing. So this is an idea of what it would have looked like in 1900. And uh, before that, the crossing, a very rural feel. And here's just a little note about the delightfully named Dulwich Chrysanthemum and Horticultural Society. Uh, who occupied the, and I, uh, what have I done? Okay, well, I'll leave the yellow lines. So let's move to Acegarth Road, uh, where we meet um, Messrs. Mitchell, um, the builders, and this is him building his houses here in 1894 at the back. Uh, there's his um, works, again, now, Converted, that's Acegarth Road. That's the other side of Acegarth Road. And you see built by James Spicer of Norwood. Um, and the houses there, you could rent them for um, 22 pounds. Uh, his ground rent was two pounds, five shillings, and four pounds, 10, uh, 84 years from 1898. So those are fairly small. And then again, here we are in Boxhall Row. Now, Boxall Row is originally built in the 1870s. Um, uh, sorry, in the 1770s. And by the 1890s, is in pretty poor condition, as this note says. The notice he's bringing the surveyor says the present condition of the cottage in Boxall Row, Boxall Row um, is, is very poor and they're not worth repairing and should be pulled down. And he did, in fact, pull them down. And the a chap called Pearson built the houses we see there today. Again, these are similar to West Dulwich Mansions. They look grander than they really are because they only have one door. But when you go inside, there's, of course, two doors. Ian, sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah, I um, need to get I, rid of that. How can I get rid of that? I, um, I'm not sure I can help you from here, but I was wondering um, if you stopped sharing your screen and then reshared it, that okay. might clear them. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Don't know quite what I've done Let's wrong. Let's try and do that again. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Fingers it's crossed. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Let's get back to where we were. 
Thanks, Ian. No, no, no. No, it was looking. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, right, slideshow. That's it. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Sorry, my fault. Mitchell Builders, the uh, builder's yard in Dulwich Village. Um, the sign says W.A. Mitchell and Son, uh, Builders and Decorators from 1797. That's a slightly optimistic view because Mitchell didn't arrive in Dulwich Village till the 1860s. And in fact, there was a plumber here who quite correctly was um, in uh, trading from 18, uh, 1797. But you can see here the old, um, what is now um, the pizza, the pizza, the pizza place, what the old building used to be like. That, of course, is the building still there, partly still on the corner here. But I'm just going to show you a few shots because Mitchell's yard, taken when it was being um, knocked down in the 1990s, and you can see the entrance. Uh, what's now Simply Fresh and the retained facade. The entrance now in Acegarth Road. View of the back, very few people, well, obviously the people who live there have seen it, but it's very difficult to see from the street because there's gates there, but it looks rather, rather pleasant sort of little enclave in Dulwich. Uh, but let's move now to Turney Road itself, and we'll start with 256 to 262, which is on the northeast corner of Acegarth Road. These date from 1898. There's four houses here. Um, the figure, building figure was, the agreed figure was 350 pounds per house. Uh, but in fact, the surveyor thought they would cost a bit more than that, 410. And the note at the bottom is quite intriguing. It says, Mr. Smith is working elsewhere. And his address was in Camberwell. And in fact, we know exactly where Mr. Smith was working because we have pictures of him and the houses he was built. And these three houses, um, you will know in College in College Road, one of which has been under reconstruction for oh, many years. Um, the one on the right was uh, refurbished very, very recently and done quite quickly. And work is just about to start on here. But here is Mr. William Smith and here is his wife, Annie. So he was quite a successful, successful builder locally. And now we go back to the bridge because we're looking now at the 1906 map, which shows, here's the railway line, which shows Turney Road largely completed as far as it was going to be before the First World War. Here is a little bit of Burbage Road, which we're not gonna talk this time. Here's Acegarth Road, here's Boxall Road, here's the schools, all here, so, and Burbage Road. So we're going to start here in Turney Road in 1903, I said. Arthur Bendel, his plans for 52 houses, which look like this. And here's the note from the minutes. Um, they're built in blocks of eight. Um, if any of you look carefully, you will note that although they appear to be the same, they are not exactly the same size. And you have to look very carefully. But um, Two of the blocks are like this and have relatively narrow gaps, brick gaps between the window and the wall here. Um, but um, two of the other blocks have another brick, so they're slightly bigger. So whether they were three and four bedroom houses, but they are slightly larger. Um, and it describes stock bricks at the back, red brick arches over the window opening, stone stills, and the, covered, and the roofs covered with slate. The agreed figure was 450 pounds. But the surveyor thought they would cost a lot more than that. They would have to be £624. And that may explain why Bendel, when the houses were completed, he held on to them. He didn't sell them. He held on to them and rented them out. Um, and here he is. This is number 82. Uh, I've shown this because there was a couple of advertisement newspapers of domestic help. Um, quite why you would put an advertisement the St. Helens Examiner, not exactly uh, near Dulwich, but anyway, in May 1919, um, they advertised for domestic. Um, not how sure it went because um, in October, they were advertising the Bournemouth Guardian, almost the other end of the country for pretty much the same thing. Perhaps um, it didn't go well. 
here's one of the doors one of the i mean one of the nice things about all the houses in tony road is the rather splendid doors and the fact that i think pretty well everybody has kept them and looked after them which is great uh, but here we have the original drawings of the house from the um, Metropolitan Archive. This is what Bendel would have submitted to the LCC for approval because he had to get approval for these porches. Can you see here? Because they projected from away from the front of the house uh, and any timber construction projecting in front of the house had to have the LCC's permission. And this dates back to the Great Fire of London. Um, not something you have to worry about now, but in 1896, in 1903, the 1896 Act was uh, was law, and you needed permission. And here are the Bendel's original drawings. Here's Bendel's original plan. Here we have Turney Road, uh, sorry, Croxford Road, the railway line, the two gaps between the houses, and here are the houses. And even here we have the typewritten approval from the LCC for these porches. Now, one of the things that Bendel asked for was that because they were only projecting very slightly, would they mind if he built them in softwood rather than the normal requirement, which is a hard because the assumption was that hardwood did not burn as, as quickly as softwood. Um, but the, the, the comment from the superintending architect says the application is approved, but with the usual conditions. So I suspect they are hardwood. But anyway, that's a use, nice, a nice sort of memory of original material. This is other stuff by Arthur Bendel, because we have met him elsewhere in, in Court Lane. Um, that's in Streatham. That's opposite in Croxted Road. Uh, this is in Ruskin Walk, and this is in Court Lane. So he was a pretty prolific builder and a very successful one, because this, of course, is his house in Court Lane, as we talked about in, in the Court Lane talk. Uh, he did very nicely and uh, was quite an early proponent of motor cars and had a, a, Vox, a rather grand Vauxhall car as uh, early as 1905. And here are the type of people who lived in his houses. Now they weren't, what of course is, is a problem in, in looking at or trying to find more information on people in roads like Turney Road is they were they weren't sort of famous, they weren't owners, they didn't appear in the newspaper very often. So they're quite difficult to track down. That's not, they're not clerks. I mean, these were, for the time, expensive houses. Um, you know, a civil engineer, builder's clerk, directory canvasser. There are odd ones like a police pensioner, obviously a wealthy police pensioner, a widow, fruit salesman. Lots of grocers, fruit salesmen, and particularly butchers in, in Dulwich at this time. Chartered accountant, Mr. Sear, we, we find him moving around Dulwich. He's, uh, he has other houses. He's, as he moves around, he's quite young when he starts here, as he moves around uh, in Farquhar Road and other places he's come up before. And here we have Mr. Adams, uh, he's only 31. He's a flooring contractor. But more interestingly, is his wife, who features an advertisement for Wynn Carnis. As you see, Mrs. Mary S. Adams, 75 Turney Road, she writes, I find Wing Canis a splendid restricted tonic when feeling run down. One bottle does the job. Wing Canis has done for me what all other tonics have failed to do. Give me strength. And she was certainly recommended. And this is the sort of advertisement Wing Canis had uh, to get over your lassitude. But it was quite a common thing in those times for advertisement to include uh, letters from happy users. But it's good that we've She's in Turney Road. Briefly, the sports grounds between uh, Bendel's houses. I'm not going to details that because we've done the sports, but just to, uh, this is the Southwark Community Sports Trust, um, was obviously the South Bank Polytechnic. And this is an original uh, drawing of what is now the pavilion, uh, it was built in 1937, 1938. That's the original brochure uh, picture, it looks slightly more glamorous perhaps there now, but architects normal and doorbell. There's the site that you all know the sports ground, there's the entrance. So Vendel is on either side here and here. Um, and there's Burbage Road. And here's the other side of the road, which of course is the Dulwich Sports Club and is only accessed from Burbage Road. So we'll move rapidly on. And this is, if you like, the three different builders. Here's Bendel. 
Here's Messrs Williams, H and H J Williams, and here is David McNeil. Um, and it's interesting here because there's a note here that Williams had built his houses but found they cost six hundred and fifty pounds, which is too much because he'd agreed five hundred and seventy five the values. So he had to change the design for the rest of his houses further down the road, as we'll see, uh, because um, he needed to knock seventy five quid off. Here's David McNeil. Um, we'll come on to Williams later, who built it elsewhere in Dulwich, as Fendel did. McNeil didn't. McNeil, looking at the, the correspondence he has with the state, he's, he's not a very confident builder. I think his houses are quite nice. And if you know them, they are different in plan because they don't have that long leg out the back, which makes them quite dark. So these are actually very light. These are quite far more modern. Uh, and this is a note, alleged stealing and receiving, people nicking stuff off building sites. They used to do it then, just as they do today. Uh, yeah, the William James Freeman was obviously the roofing contractor with the zinc. But anyway, these are David McNeil's houses. Here's another shot. Again, fine door surround, all kept in good condition. And there's the original drawings again. David McNeil's drawing, same thing for... I think this is more for the gable. This is the section through the construction. There's the elevation. And there's his plan, eight houses. Slightly optimistic plan, although you can see that the, the breaks in the drawing. But those are his eight houses. And one of the residents in one of his houses, 113 Turney Road, was a chap called Ben Benison. And we were quite lucky here. We put him in uh, Mr. Google, and up he comes. He was a really well-known boxing reporter. And you can see him here reporting from New York for and Germany for world heavyweight flights. And we even got records of him traveling in and out of America on, uh, on the Queen Mary to, to do it. So he was very well known journalist. I mean, 1911, he just calls himself a new newspaper journalist, but he was a very well known sporting reporter. And now we move on to Messrs. Williams. We're further down Turney Road, moving. We've passed David uh, McNeil. Uh, and here they, he uses an architect. Williams was actually slightly more prone to using architects than some other builders. Uh, and AJ Lansdowne here. Um, and here again are the, we don't have the original drawings, unfortunately, but you can see the porches. And I'm sure they would have needed the same permission as the other builders. And here again, a rather fine door case, door. Here's some other stuff by Messrs. Williams at the time, Dover Court Road here on the left and Rosendale Road here on the right. Uh, they actually did quite a lot of work after World War I as well, but um, that's for a different talk in Burbage Road and Dulwich Village. This is the four houses at 228 to 234, which was built by Chuckle Russell. Uh, and there's a, a note how um, the, the son, unfortunately, the builder died and they had to, the father had to take over the, the contract. But these are not dissimilar from uh, William's houses. And here we have um, houses a little bit further down. Uh, we meet George Harris. George Harris was a, quite a well-known builder in the area, mainly in Hearn Hill, not so much in Dulwich, uh, but these houses here, and this is an interesting minute here because um, up until about 1900, all estate leases were 84 years. That's based on the original 21 years, uh, which was um, doubled and then doubled again to 84 years. And from then on, it really was 99 years because it was difficult to get a mortgage. And the residents are complaining here. So obviously half the houses were on 84 year leases. Uh, six houses, sorry, and the other four on 99 year leases. So they thought it was a bit unfair. Not quite sure how it was resolved. Um, he, Harris was rather good at, he was rather good at advertising as well. You can see um, this is a slightly better picture. Uh, price 525. And um, we've got here sort of easily read to be sold semi detached houses, four bedrooms, two sitting rooms, kitchen, scullery, and bath bathroom, side entrance and bicycle shed. Now, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get hold of a picture of the bicycle shed, but you could say that um, given the uh, 
the popularity of bicycles now, Mr. Harris was um, really ahead of his time. But of course he had electric bills and gas as well, because in those days, uh, no one was sure that electricity was gonna be the answer. So both the, the houses would have had both gas and electrical lighting. And again, you see, even though the convenience to stations was an important part of the, of the sales pitch. But to show you how successful George Harris was, this is his own house in Burbage Road, number six Burbage Road. In fact, he built both these houses, number six and number eight. And here we are at um, coming up towards World War I. Um, this is the 1911 Orton survey marked up. You can see here are the houses. Here's Bendel. Here's a um, bit of Williams. Here's McNeil. Here's a bit more of Williams. We're not worried about Burbage Road or any of those. And you can see there's the big space here, Farrow's Bank Sports Ground. There's a gap here, gap here, gap here, Tell South Athletic Ground. So this is really as far as they got before 1914. But just to give you another reminder that some things don't change, here is Turney Road flooded in 1915. Um, as he says in this note, during the past few years, and particularly during this winter, perhaps the wettest on record, complaints have been made by tenants of houses on the southeast side of Turney Road of the flooding of land, houses and gardens, owing to the stoppage of the outfall drain to the sewer in Turney Road. Now, of course, the flooding that we had uh, more recently um, is not so much to do with this, but it's quite interesting that they had it as long as go as that. We pity that we can't get a better photograph, but this is the best photograph that I've managed to get. And um, they did do some work. They put some French drains in, in the sports grounds, and I think we've done more work since to, to get it right. So that was pretty much the only thing that happened in World War I. Until we come to the post-World War I period, 1919, 1920, and we have, we meet the Dulwich Estate Public Utility Society and their development here in Turney Road and in Roseway. Um, you can see this aerial shot from Google Maps. Here's the school down here. Here are some of the other houses we've looked at. Um, and of course, this is connected with the Sunray and Casino House Estate because post-1980, in September 1918, they set up this committee to look at how they would build um, on the estate after World War I because clearly there was going to be a huge demand for houses. And E.T. Hall, who was a well-known architect who sat on the, the estate governors, came up with this great scheme. Here's Casino and Sunray Gardens Estate. Uh, this was their main one, and um, Roseway and Turney Road was their secondary one. But as we know now, then the reality, they couldn't, although they set up the building society, the Dulwich Estate Public Utility Society, to get funds, um, there was no way they were going to raise funds to do Sunray and Casino, and that's why that was taken over by Camberwell. But they did have enough funds to do here, to do Turney Road and Roseway. Uh, and if you think about it, the Roseway and Tony Road, these houses look not dissimilar from the ones in Sunray. They're slightly bigger. Um, here we are in Roseway itself, and they're all painted now. Um, of course, they weren't all painted when they began, and there are one or two still in their original condition. And in fact, that's what most houses in Dulwich, which were rendered, um, that's exactly what they look like. Painting the white is a relatively recent invention. But the interesting thing is to compare the plans. Now, here are the plans that E.T. Hall produced of the houses. And here are the plans in the Tudor Walters report, which were used in the um, Sunray estate for the homes fit for heroes. This was the, uh, and you can see here the living room. Here again, very similar. Here, sorry. Scullery or kitchen. The coals, the larder here and the dining area or parlour. The only difference between E.T. Hall's design and the original design here is he's put in a corridor. So the houses are slightly bigger. And of course, he's got four bedrooms. Um, in fact, I've put both levels, sorry. I've got, but you could, he's got four bedrooms upstairs um, and the staircase, but the principal, hmm, I'll pass on rapidly. Uh, most famous resident here, perhaps, Pro, uh, Professor Len Lamerton, who was um, uh, 
a leader in powering uh, on radiation biology of cancer. So now we get radiation to destroy cancers. He was a major um, exponent of it. I mean, as it says here, Royal Cancer Hospital, he was scientific secretary of the first United Nations conference on the peaceful uses of atomic energy. Um, very well-known character at the time in the 50s. He lived in Roseway in the 50s and 60s, and early 60s. So we're coming to the end of the 20s. Here's a few more uh, houses in uh, the just before the Burbage Road uh, Circus, as it was called. Um, there's a couple of houses on the other side of Turney Road, uh, opposite the um, Roseway. And here's the Burbage Road Circus. Um, that is for a talk on Burbage Road, but you can see here, this is the Turney Road and how this area was, you've got these big houses put in here, but as I say, that's done, done much at the same time, 21, 22, 23, and Burbage Road leading down here, and you've got Roseway and everything there. So to get to, there's a 1930s shot of Turney, um, the curves, does, it's difficult to see whether it's actually been made up with tarmac, um, but you know, uh, but very, the houses do look pretty, pretty scruffy, pretty dark. And just to finish off, a few of the more modern ones. This is 260, so this is 268, uh, recently bought by the governors and refurbished pending uh, redevelopment at some point. And this is 266, which of course was rebuilt recently as that. Uh, in 2017 by Middleman Associates. Uh, rather nice little house on the corner there. And of course now Boxall Row is development central, having been left fallow for years as it were. And this is the last house, number 80, uh, built in 2000 on site of some old garages further down, again towards the railway bridge. And here is the railway bridge, and there is the end.